Good morning, good evening, and afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to my YouTube channel here as we wrap up an amazing NFL season here today. I am your host, Matt, and we're here to recap and react to Super Bowl 57. So the Super Bowl was a couple days ago, and I didn't get a chance to uh, to record something that night. I was a little amped up, as you can imagine, and it took me a long time to go to sleep that night. Um, but I'm here today. I'm here to finally get my thoughts out and talk about this Super Bowl, react to what I saw, and just provide a just you know a, a bow on top of the present that was the. NFL playoffs, especially for my Kansas City Chiefs. So, um, one of the one of the really big things um, out of this game was, or really out of out of the playoffs, was just how Patrick Mahomes played. You know, through a lot of adversity um, because of the the injury to his ankle, and I'm going to talk more about that in a, in a little bit. But if there's any doubt anymore about who who Patrick Mahomes is and, you know, in what he does by putting, putting himself, you know, in harm's way, you know, just laying it all on the line and the, the absolute competitor that he is. Um, there's no question about that anymore. The last two seasons that I've done this, so this is the third season I've done, you know, you know, these previews and reviews and reactions to the playoffs and this year I kind of dabbled in a couple of the week-to-week -week stuff towards the end of the season. I hope next year to do more regular content on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, I don't intend to change or to, you know, I don't think this channel is ever going to grow into something overly large like um, like what Tom Grassi has with, with his with his deal. But, you know, he started just like me, just started as a, as a guy working a regular 8-to-5 job and then his channel just blew up. I, sometimes there's no reason for it. Sometimes it's, you just get lucky. Um, and then of course there's a, you know, Cole, uh, Cole, the Strauss or South. I, I can't remember his last name, but he's a chiefs guy. Um, he does the channel. How about those chiefs on YouTube? And, you know, he's gotten a quite a big following as well. And, and he's even been on Tom's show before. And, you know, maybe maybe one day my show or my channel will, will grow that large. Probably not because I don't – I'm not as consistent with the content and stuff like that. But, um, but it is nice, you know, the last two seasons, you know, that how the seasons both ended in, in you know, defeat for the Chiefs. And obviously the, the Super Bowl loss to the Buccaneers was, you know – it wasn't that hard to take because of the way the Chiefs lost. Last year was devastating, uh, you know, losing to the Bengals the way that we did, you know, with the uh, going to overtime and then just blowing that second half lead and then finally getting over the hump against the Bengals this year in the AFC Championship game. Of course, I've, I've talked about that game several times already. And then moving on, you know, to face a team that in, in the Eagles – you know, and then, but all of the, <laughs> all of the pomp and circumstance that came with that, you know, with the Kelsey brothers and, um, you know, and Andy Reid going up against his former team, you know, there was a, there was a lot to get to here. So I want to switch over here to the, uh, to the ESPN. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not, a, I'm like I said, I'm not a box score guy. You know, it's like, oh, we'll just look at the box score and let's just. But I, I do want to. Um, I want to highlight a couple things that I saw here. And as you can see here on the screen. You know, both teams traded touchdowns and then then the, it was three and out for the Eagles and then the Chiefs missed a field goal. The Eagles were really, you know, especially after the Chiefs missed that field goal. Um they were they were riding high and the eagles took a lot of momentum a lot of it you know into into halftime um i admit i was a little down and i kept thinking i i was actually thinking to myself this is this to me it felt like the buccaneers game at that point i i really did i 
you know, part of the Buccaneers game, I was, I was, I was thinking, you know, it's twenty-one to six. You know, maybe, maybe if we get a couple stops, and really the Chiefs only gave up ten more points in that game, but the offense just couldn't do anything against Tampa Bay's uh, defense against their front four, and they just just wilted. And the difference between that game and this game is, the Chiefs came out in the second half and played a perfect half of fo- football. I. I would call it Andy Andy Reid's masterpiece. His it, it, it's like it's like any great painter who creates their ultimate masterpiece. It, this was his Mona Lisa essentially uh, in the second half. Everything he did was perfect in terms of game management, play calling in the in that second half. Uh, the execution was spot on, and even when things didn't weren't set up or lined up you know the exact way they wanted it to it still worked out and i'll talk about one of those plays here in a second so again the overall and i'm let me go back just i guess i'll just click back on the box score because i I don't really want to go through play by play but just to have some of this stuff up here i i was uh like i said i was a little down at halftime so but then i remembered who the quarterback was it was a this 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 video is a lot easier to make. Well, actually, you know, the funny thing is, is that there's no stress in making this video. Sometimes you think to yourself, "What are you going to talk about? What are you just going to gush all over your team all over again?" Um, there's more to talk about when the team loses, because you can pick out things that could have gone better or you should have done differently. Because you know we're all we're we're all really used to second guessing, and. You know, my Super Bowl video in 2020 um, or 2021, two years ago, that video went viral, at least for me, went viral, like like 60,000 views is a lot for a channel of my size. And I I don't know how it I hit the YouTube algorithm. Uh, maybe it got shared around with some some Bucks fans who I guess liked the way that I reacted to the game um, because I gave a lot of credit to the Tam- to Tampa Bay and I didn't blame the refs. So um so let's go ahead and talk about this game and some what I consider the the big takeaways. And if you look, I, I did I went and bought this shirt the night the night after or that night when we when the Chiefs won. This is still where, where is it? Is it on this side? Yeah, right there. This is the old hat. <laughs> this is Super Bowl Fifty Four hat. I didn't buy. I didn't. They didn't have hats that night because I went to I went to Hy-Vee to get to get my shirt. So because there was no line. <laughs> um. So let's talk about the big storylines, you know, coming out of this game. First of all, I, I want to start with the Philadelphia Eagles. I, I, in my preview video, I said that the Chiefs were going to probably win by multiple, not by you know, by two or three scores. I based that on the fact that I didn't think Jalen Hurts could throw to his right. Now I was I was actually proven correct in that he only threw to his right. I want to say four times in the game, and he, only, and he completed two passes. One of them probably shouldn't have been a completion. That was that. That was that third and sixteen play to uh, to um, what was this? What was his name? Um, Dallas Goddard, yeah. Or that it was that for that for seventeen yards. I that that play shouldn't have been. I don't. I don't know how that was upheld personally because the ball was moving and the ball and the ball hit the ground. Um, again, we'll talk about the officiating here and coming up in a little bit. But there was only two passes he completed to his right all game. What Jalen Hurts did really well was he put his team in constant position to to succeed on third and fourth downs when it was really, really short yardage situations. Um, I want to say they were 10 of 19 on third down and they converted three fourth downs. So that's 13 of 19. And one of those third down plays they fumbled. And that was returned by Bolton for a touchdown. Uh, Jalen Hurts was very, very impressive. I, I came, a, I came away from this game thinking, you know, there was at any one time Jalen Hurts could have made a big play with his legs or with his arm, throwing to his left, mind you. He wasn't throwing to his right. Um, but I was thinking at any one time he could do something, and the Chiefs got just enough stops on him to create it. Just enough pressure, and 
made him make one mistake. Or at least one big, big mistake, which was the fumble. And, I, and even then, if you go to that fumble, that wasn't really anything the Chiefs did there. He just, he was in the process of transferring the ball from one hand to the other and he dropped it. It just... You ever, you ever just, you know, walking through your house and you're holding something and it just falls out of your hand and you're like, why did I drop that? I mean, how in the world did I just, how did I drop this, you know, whatever, whatever you're holding and, you know, a glass of water or a, um, it could be anything. How, how could, or you bought a water bottle or something, you know, you're, you're painting and you're painting, you just drop your paintbrush. You're like, how does that happen? I don't know. We're human beings. We make mistakes. And that's that's really what that was. That was a mistake that he made an unforced error that, that had catastrophic, um, had a catastrophic uh, response to it, you know, for, for the Eagles because the Chiefs got an immediate touchdown. This was a great game to watch, um, especially if you weren't a Chiefs or Eagles fan. <laughs> it was it was highly entertaining. It was back and forth. Great players making great plays. Um, Nick Sirianni, you know, this guy stayed true to what got him here. He was very aggressive on, on fourth downs. Uh, he didn't miss a single fourth down. You know, there's one, I, I think they actually said he missed a fourth down conversion, but the chiefs were got it offside. So I, that doesn't technically in the statistics count as a fourth down conversion. Um, but every time it got to fourth down, then he didn't punt. They converted. Yeah. So it was hard for the Chiefs' defense to get off the field. But like I said, they did just enough to, to get through. And I have a ton of respect now for Jalen Hurts. I'm not going to say that I was a doubter of him. I, I think that my doubts in him in this game came just for stemming from his shoulder injury. And without the shoulder injury, I think he's can be a very, very good NFL uh, quarterback. There's a lot of people that are putting him as saying that he was the second best quarterback in the league now behind Mahomes. I'm not going to go there. I think he's very talented. I I, I do want to see a little more um, consistent play out of him. Obviously, last year was was a kind of a hit or miss season, and they, and they made the playoffs. You know, once they kind of sold out to running the football. This year, he obviously, he showed the ability to throw the ball more, but he also had a big-time wide receiver this year in A.J. Brown. Uh, the Eagles have 20 free agents, 20 key free agents that are going to be up for new contracts or potentially being not re-signed and go to other teams. There's, I, You know, every time somebody loses a game like this, the talk is always, well, they'll be back. Well, it, not necessarily. And... For the Eagles to be back here, they're going to have to address a lot of those questions about, you know, what some of their key players on offense and defense are going to do. Obviously, Jalen Hurts will be there, and he's the most important person, you know, coming back, especially with that um, that offensive line of his that is just one of the best offensive lines in football. The Chiefs did get two sacks in the game, but they were kind of, I call them cheapy sacks. And when I say cheapy sacks, they were both of them came when Hurts ran out of bounds a yard behind the line of scrimmage, which is technically a sack. So Leo Chanel and was it Derek Naughty? There, let's let's scroll let's scroll down here and see. Leo Chanel and Kalen Saunders. Okay, so both of Leo Chanel and Kalen Saunders both were credited with sacks when Hertz ran out of bounds. So they didn't actually get a traditional sack on him in the game. Um which I thought they would. I thought they would, but they pressured him a lot, and a lot of the uh, the incompletions that he had, and he had eleven of them, um, a couple of them to end drives, where they were a result of pressure. So, you know, Chris Jones and Frank Clark didn't have any sacks themselves, but they did a lot up front, as with George Carflotis and Carlos Dunlap. They did a lot up front. Derek Naughty, they 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 did enough to collapse that pocket and. They held their own against the the tremendous offensive line of of the Eagles. Now that that short wedge buster play, you know that rugby scrum they run on third and third and fourth and short, um, they were successful on it every time they ran it. Well, I take that back. There was one third and short that they weren't successful on when they when they did, they actually ran a fake out of it and then they ran a counter pitch that the Chiefs um, they were able to stop for no gain. 
But then it was fourth down and they ran the same play, or then they ran another, just sneak up the middle and got the first down. So that, that that's from that series standpoint, it didn't really matter. But um, but overall, I was really impressed with Jalen Hurts and what I saw in his toughness and his leadership on the field. And it's not going to be because of Jalen Hurts why the Eagles might take a step back next year. It'll just be because, you know, they're – they lost both of their offense and defensive coordinators or they're going to lose them. I think they're both up for, I think they're both like the, um, I think they're both the leading candidates for two different jobs. Um, I think one's with the Cardinals and I, I don't know. I, I have to go back and look. Um, yeah, but it's, they just have a lot of questions in, in terms of replacing guys that they possibly could lose. And that's a key thing in this league is, you know, the constant replacement of players because you can't sign everybody. There is a salary cap. And so let's let's kick let's kick it over to the Chiefs side now that, you know, we gave the Eagles their flowers and you know, congratulated them on a great game. You know, this wasn't a game that any that that the Eagles lost. Okay? The Eagles didn't do anything to quote unquote lose this game, like you see. This was a game that the Chiefs went out and just beat them. They they won. They made a few more plays at the end to win. And they deserved it. At halftime, in the in the first half, the Chiefs were moving the ball. I, I will I will give Andy Reid the one thing I think he missed did a misstep on in this game was I, you know, going for the field goal. Uh, with, I think that was in the first quarter, it may have been the second quarter, but it was the second drive of the game for the Chiefs, and Butker missed it. It was a forty-two yarder. It wasn't a terribly long field goal. But I think with the situation with the, with the field that you're playing on, um, that turf out there was just absolutely horrendous. Both teams talked about how bad uh, the field condition was, which which is inexcusable for a Super Bowl for a field to be in that position. I, I it, it was it was a fourth and three situation. I would have liked the Chiefs to go for it there. They ended up missing the field goal, so it was like nothing happened. So if they don't make it, if they don't make the first down. They have the exact same result as they had by missing the field goal. So, and in a game where you had already seen, you know, the Eagles drive down almost, you know, with no resistance on the first drive of the game. Sorry, my nose is itching again. Um, there was no resistance on that first drive. They did obviously force a punt on the second drive. But I, the Chiefs needed to be a little more aggressive in that situation. And now, granted, it's easy to talk about like that after a win. Could the game been a, could it have been a little different? Um, well, possibly. I don't think it would have created that much of a difference in the in the final score or the final situation. Well, actually, it may have. McKinnon may have decided to run in the end zone if, if the Chiefs had a had a three point lead there or a four point lead. So, because um, that would have put it up to minimum of two scores. So the Chiefs were down 24-14 at half, and it did not feel like a 10-point lead. It felt like the Chiefs were down three touchdowns um, because they the second touchdown they got was a defensive score on the Nick Bolton fumble return, and that was the equalizer in that first half. And without that, the Chiefs probably don't win this game. Matter of fact, they probably don't win this game if they don't get that touchdown. Maybe Mahomes finds a way to do a little more, we get another drive somewhere along the line. But the Chiefs needed every one of their possessions in the second half. They had four possessions. They scored on all four of them. That was it. And so there was – they had to be perfect in the second half, and they were. Like I said earlier, at halftime, I I was sitting there thinking that, that it was kind of like the year before or two years prior. And I got up – so I was at a, my buddy Tony's house, and we were – in his in his basement, it's situated where he's got a fireplace in the middle, and he's got a TV on each side. It's like a wide open basement, and my wife and Tony's wife were on the other side, and everybody else, there was like twelve of us, were on the other side watching it together. So I decided to get up, go sit with my wife, and say maybe maybe we need someone needs to change something up. You know, we <laughs> we all have to do our part. A little superstitious in that in that regard, and. So I said, I'm going to sit on this chair by myself and watch the game with my wife and, and my buddy's wife. And um, while well, everybody else was watching it, including my son, who was now no longer with me, you know, he was on the other side of the room. And what happened 
the Chiefs immediately come out at halftime, and I didn't think. Well, first of all, I didn't think Henny was going to play. I, I didn't think Henny was going to come in. I, I knew that hit home, Patrick Mahomes was going to get whatever treatment he needed to get back out there on that field. And he came out and led a drive straight down the field, and the Chiefs got back within three points. That to me was the at that point I was, of course I was on pins and needles already, but that touchdown to me put me at a lot more ease. If they didn't get a touchdown there, or any points at all, I, I mean they could have taken a field goal if they wouldn't have got it in, you know, and and been down twenty four seventeen. But the fact that they went down and got a touchdown, and Pacheco got the you know his first uh, Super Bowl touchdown, and then, then then they were only down three, and I'm like, if we can just get a break, if we can just get a stop, another stop here, then then we're gonna. I, I then I thought we were gonna win, and of course the the subsequent drive by the the Eagles, um, they go down, take up a lot of time, and only get a field goal out of it. And when they kicked that field goal to go, go up 27, um, go up 27, 21, I knew it that that was the moment I knew the Chiefs were going to win the football game. I was like, nope, we are we are now we're now going to go down and score again and take the lead, and it's going to probably go ping pong back and forth. And I was mentally starting to do the math in my head about how long drives typically take, you know, and I was kind of fudging numbers, not fudging numbers, but I was kind of going over the numbers in my head and like, well, if, if, if this possession takes four to six minutes and this one and the Eagles get it, it takes four to six. And I was assuming everyone was going to get touchdowns. The chiefs were going to have the ball with about them with about two minutes left with a chance to win the game. That's, that's how it was kind of going to play out. What flipped the script though, was the fact that the chiefs went down, scored a touchdown, go up 28, 27. And then they were able to get the Eagles to go three and out again. Now, I, the Chiefs probably could have taken some of the drama out of this game if they would have just had a touchdown drive in the next one to go up 35-27. But Kadarius Tony, you know, he decides to, uh, he had the tremendous punt return down to the five-yard line. Um, ironically, that actually worked in the Eagles' favor from a clock standpoint. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the Chiefs go up eight, and then the, the Eagles come right back, and it looked like they were going to take up a lot of time. They weren't moving the ball tremendously, but then just the long pass on the sideline on the busted coverage with, you know, to A.J. Brown, there, where he goes out at the two-yard line. Um, and, you know, the people at my party were kind of going, oh, oh, man, oh. And then my wife was like, oh, why did why did he catch that ball? And I'm I'm just, I'm sitting there just chilling like a villain. You know, I'm, I'm like, you know what? All they can do is tie us here. At the at the at the very worst, they would tie us. At the best, you know, we were going to still have the lead, regardless if they got a touchdown. Maybe they don't get the two point conversion, or maybe we stop them on four tries and, or three tries and then kick a field goal. What whatever the case was, I knew that the Chiefs weren't going to be losing when they got the ball back with a, with five minutes to go in the game. And the difference between the Chiefs of this year and the Chiefs of uh, even the year they won the Super Bowl. Um, or, you know, you go back to the year of Patrick Mahomes' first year in the league. The Chiefs weren't going to go down and score in two minutes. They were going to take all the time possible. And that's what they did. They, they, they had five minutes and 15 seconds, and they took, um, and they took five minutes and four seconds to go down and get that, t- to go down and get that field goal. Uh, to put them up, they only gave the they only gave the other team no. It was five minutes and there was no, there was a there was nine seconds left. I can't remember something like that. There was uh, eight second. That's right. There was eight seconds left. So it was five minutes and seven seconds that it took because there was eight seconds left um, when we kicked off at the end. So lots of lots of really good plays to go around. How do you? Obviously, Patrick Mahomes was the MVP because he, and I think, and I think that's the right call because Mahomes was definitely the best player, especially in that second half. He was perfect. He was absolutely perfect in that second half, and 
there was some talk about how, you know, could Jalen Hurts be the MVP in a losing effort? Well, I don't think the NFL, that's only happened one time. That was, a, and I don't remember the gentleman's name, but it was the Super Bowl five. Um, it was a guy from the Colts um, who was named the MVP, even though his team lost. Or it was, or was it the Cowboys? I don't know. Who, I know it was Super Bowl five. I, that's, I do know that. It was a defensive player. Um, and that's the only time the losing team the, the only time the MVP was from the losing team so they're not going to give the MVP to uh to someone on the losing team anymore and in this in this case I think Patrick Mahomes was a was a really solid candidate now there was some people talking about how Nick Bolton maybe should have got it because he scored a touchdown on the fumble return and he had nine tackles he didn't have any sacks he didn't have any interceptions but he played a tremendous role in stopping the run as you guys can see here on the screen you know, you take out Jalen Hurts' runs, which, I mean, he was 15 for 70, and his longest was 28. So, so if you take out the, uh, you take out those 28 yards, he's got, what's that? Um, that's 42 yards. So then it's a really, you take out his longest, I always like to take out the, the guy's longest run to kind of, to get a, a true, I always like to take the outlier out. So if you take the 28-yard run out, then he's 14 carries for 42 yards. So what is that? Let's let's do some let's do some quick math here. So that's three yards. Jeez, oh, I just embarrassed myself on YouTube there. I should have been able to do that in my head, but I'm not. I'm not a math major. <laughs> so three yards a carry outside his longest run. Um, he had a, um, three yard average. Sorry, had to answer a text there. Um, so it's, yeah, so, so Nick Bolton and Willie Gay too, both, but I'll I'll talk about Bolton. So if you look at the rest of these guys, you know, Kenneth Gainwell, mm-hmm. seven for twenty-one. That's a three-yard average. Miles Sanders, seven for seven for sixteen. That's like two point two. And then Boston Scott was three carries for eight yards. Um, one second here. Let me. Okay. Um, the Chiefs did an amazing job on those running backs. And they were the strength of the Eagles. And Nick Bolton was fantastic. Now, I think Nick Bolton probably would have been MVP if he would have gotten that second touchdown that was... Well, it was initially called a touchdown on another fumble. Um, and I can't remember the, who it was. It was one of the receivers, though. And, but it was ultimately counted as an incomplete pass. It was, it was bang, bang. But I, again, it gets down to this point where, so let's, let's go ahead and segue now into the talk of the officiating, because I think this is a good, a good, a good point to talk about it. We're almost 30 minutes in the video and I, and I only have about 15 minutes left anyway. Um, so let's talk about the officiating. So let's talk, let's, let's first talk about the catch, the Nick Bolton uh, touchdown that came back. That that was a huge, huge turning point. That would have that would have put the Chiefs ahead 28-27. And um or it was or no, it would have been 28-24. It would have put the Chiefs ahead 28-24. You know, it would it would have definitely would have widened the gap even more. Um the I guess what they what the ref saw was that he didn't make a football move. But he definitely caught the ball, had two feet down, and then was hit and then fumbled. I I mean, if if you make the catch two feet down and get knocked out of bounds, that's a catch. Why is that not a catch in the field of play? I why do you have to make a football move if you're not on the sideline? I I don't when fans like me who know about the game of football, we're not I'm not an expert at football, but I know about the game. If I cannot de- de- determine what a catch is and what a catch isn't, I think that's bad for the game. 
Um, and then the second play that happened was the the pass to Dallas Goddard on the it was like third and 16, third and 15 and they got a, it was a 17 yard pass of completion to the right. Um, only one of only two passes that that Hurts completed to his right all night. It also should not have been a catch. They ruled it a catch on the field. Andy Reid challenged it. The ball, the ball was juggling around in his hands. And so he did not possess the ball when his first foot was down. And by the time he did secure it, he got one foot down. And then when he came, then he went down on the sideline out of bounds, the tip of the, the ball hits the ground. He doesn't have his hands underneath it. The ball clearly hits the ground, but yet they still call it a catch. So again, I I don't understand, I don't understand how either of those plays officially were called the way they were. The Chiefs, the I mean, I'm not just saying this from a Chiefs fan standpoint. Um, I can I can somewhat understand if they if they claim that the receiver for Philly didn't make a football move, you know, and and that's why they counted as an incomplete pass instead of a fumble. I can, I can see that. I, you know, I can squint real closely, and I can, and I can see that. The Dallas Goddard catch is not. I don't understand how they upheld that, because replay clearly showed that the that he did not have control of the ball when his first foot was down. The ball was bouncing all over on him. He did not, and he bobbled it on the way to the ground. And then the ball hit the ground. He did not secure it. He did not secure the ball. The ball did not survive the fall. So, again, both of those plays cannot happen. You can't tell me, the same officiating crew, you cannot tell me that one, that both of those plays are, were both, which were both reviewed, that they're both, that's both what they, the conclusion they came to, because they're two opposite conclusions. And I don't understand that. And it doesn't make any sense. And it shows the inconsistency, especially with Carl Cheffers. Now, it wasn't Carl Cheffers' crew, but it, he was the lead uh, official in the game. So now I, I'll give the refs some credit. They, they, blew, they blew very few whistles, they kept the flags in their pocket most of the night. So a lot of that was to my dismay because there was there was a couple defensive holdings and there was one uh you know in the first half on Juju Smith Schuster and Bradbury that um uh James Bradbury that probably should have been called and then the amount of delay of games that were not called they called one delay of game on Philly but they but there were seven others that I counted I kept I kept track of and this was only in the second half but there were seven other times where they did not call delay of game when when it should have been delay of game. Now I understand the whole thing. They if it's zero, the official looks up, or he's he's watching the clock, and if it hits zero, and then the then the time it takes him to look at the clock to look to see if they're snapping it, if they're in the process or they get ready to, a lot of times they're, they're, he's gonna not blow the whistle. But again, that makes it a 41 or a 42 second play clock, not a 40 second play clock. This is not hard to me. I think it should be like the shot clock in the NF, in the NBA or college where the horn sounds and look, if that ball's not moving, go back and review it, then it's a then it's a penalty. Now, do we want to review every single time when the ball gets that way? I, I don't know if we do or not, but that's where that sky judge really can come into play. And look, they the, the Eagles were obviously, there was part of the game plan was to take as much time as possible to, to bleed as much clock as possible so Patrick Mahomes got as few possessions as possible. Because I think the Eagles, even though they were claimed as the you know the best defense in the NFL, they knew that their defense could not stop the Chiefs, obviously, and they didn't. Um, so again, I think the Sky Judge could do a lot better job on those delay of games and getting and getting the the pre-snap penalties called uh, that are deserved that deservedly be need to be called. Now, let's talk about the, the play that everybody was talking about at the end. So tied at 35, Mahomes had already you know driven this driven the Chiefs down to about the 15-yard line. It was third and nine and or third and eight. And he throws a pass to uh, to Smith Schuster um, that was incomplete. It would have brought up a fourth down, but a flag came out. 
when I saw the play live, I th- I didn't see the initial hold because I was watching Mahomes. I wasn't watching the receivers when I was on the on the television. Um, but the way that the pass was thrown and it was like five or six yards past him into the end zone. I immediately I didn't say this, but I immediately thought to myself, Juju had to have been helped. Mahomes doesn't miss by that much unless he's purposely throwing the ball away. I said this this looks like a classic example of you know, of a quarterback overthrowing the receiver because the, because the receiver wasn't in the spot he was supposed to be, even though he was running that route. He was running the route he was supposed to be, but he was late. It was like, Smith Schuster's a good route runner. He's not going to be late on his break unless he was held. And immediately, you know, so I'm thinking all this in like a process in a matter of a second or two in my head. And immediately the flag came out and they called uh, James Bradbury for holding. So was it a hold? Oh, we yes, it, it was definitely a hold. Okay, um, you can look at any still shot of it. You can watch the replay. Where the television broadcast, in my opinion, failed was that they only showed the second half of it, and so the second half of it looked like it just was Bradbury's hand on Juju Smith's back. And so you're like, well, why was that called a hold? He wasn't holding there. Well, you're right, he wasn't holding there. But it was it was the shot before that. And they say, well, you can make contact, you know, within five yards of the line of scrimmage. Doesn't matter. No, you, you, well, you can make contact, but you can't. You can jam, but you can't hold. And he clearly had a hold of his jersey. The officials are going to call that all the time if if they see it. Now, in the first half, same two players, Smith Schuster and Bradbury. He had a hold of Smith Schuster's jersey. The official didn't see it, so he didn't call a flag. Didn't 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 throw the flag. Didn't didn't blow the whistle. He saw it this time. The argument that's being made on social media that somehow that the because of the point of the game that this was, that the official should not have thrown the flag because oh just let the players play play it out let the players decide the game don't don't let a flag decide the game. Well, why is why is that the fair outcome? Ask yourself that. Why why should we be allowed? Why should defensive players be allowed to gain an advantage and commit a penalty that they know is not going to be called in the final two minutes? That That's not letting the players play it out. That's breaking the rule book in your favor because you, you have this knowledge that the refs aren't going to call a penalty. That's not, that's not the intent of the, of the rule. That's not the intent of the game. And so everybody who... So really, it's it's not about people that want the calls to be equal, you know, or the or the people that are saying that they oh we just I just want consistency. I heard that from somebody. Now, granted, not from Eagles fans. So if Eagles fans are watching this, I did not hear this from Eagles fans on Twitter. You know who I heard it from? Bills fans, Chargers fans, Bengals fans, Broncos fans. Those four fan bases. Those were the ones that were crying about this. Yeah, I'm sure there were Eagles fans that were upset about it too. But all the Eagles fans I interacted with on Twitter and saw, they were they were taking their medicine like men. So I, I got no problems with them. They they stepped up. They they had you know, I'm like I said, I know they were upset about it, okay? I am not going to sit here and say that they were so, you know, gracious and defeat and they were, you know, they, they just, "Oh, no, it's fine. We committed a penalty." No, I I know that they were ticked off and upset, but they didn't blame it on that play, at least the ones that I saw, okay? Again, I know there was probably some that did that I didn't see, which is which is totally fine because there's plenty of Chiefs fans who have blamed the referees for losses before. I have done that, okay? I'm not going to sit here and say I've never done that. I have done that. I did that when the Chiefs lost to the Steelers in the playoffs like six years ago, six, seven years ago. Um, I did it when the Chiefs lost to the Titans. Because in those games, I couldn't I couldn't reconcile the fact that the Chiefs lost to inferior teams. This time, the guy obviously made he 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 held onto the jersey. He impeded his ability to get away and to, and to start his route. Without doing that, he probably allows a touchdown. And ironically enough, if he doesn't hold him and, and, and they score the touchdown, the Eagles probably have a much better shot of winning the game than obviously what, than what happened. Um, so, 
again, because at that point, the Eagles needed as much time as possible in order to win the game. Uh, the Chiefs were, were, they were, they call it church mode. Um, they were going to go down and sacrifice as much time as possible and sacrifice not scoring a touchdown in order to bleed out as much of the clock as they could. So what do the, uh, so what does this all mean? I, I think the people that are most upset about this are the national media people who all pick the Eagles uh, to win this game. So to them, they have to justify in their minds why their pick is still the correct pick. So the next day, it was everything was all about, well, Bradbury, the, yes, he held him, but they shouldn't have called the penalty. And then the discussion switched to, well, Jalen Hurts actually outplayed Patrick Mahomes. Look, if you're making a prediction on a football game, don't root for your prediction so much that you fail to see what the other team did. Let's the Chiefs played one of the most complete football the complete football games that I've ever seen, and and they came out with a win because of it. Was it unfortunate for the Eagles that that penalty occurred when it did? Oh, of course it was. I mean, even as a Chiefs fan, I have to admit I was like, yeah, that's that's not the way that anybody wants a game to end but it was a penalty and it and it did impact the play and we have to we have to get past this this whole notion that penalties at the end of games shouldn't be called i mean how many times did did i have to go on twitter or facebook or whatever and defend the chiefs like they need my defense but um you know in the in the afc championship game conclusion about why Matt, patrick mahomes why they should have thrown, why the the, nece- the unnecessary roughness late hit out of bounds, why it was the right call. Of course it was the right call. The guy was, he was three steps out of bounds when he got hit. Of course it was the right call. And how this was even a a controversy or even a a, a notion is was just absolutely ludicrous. But again, it goes back to the whole situation of, of people who are predicting games when the prediction just doesn't go their way, they have to find some reason to justify why their pick was still correct. It can't be the fact that they're just wrong. It can't be the fact that the team they picked just lost. It has to be some exterior boogeyman as to why their pick wasn't correct. Who's the easiest boogeyman to blame? Well, it's the refs. Let me tell you something. Blaming the refs, and this goes for Chiefs fans, myself included, when I... if You know, when I've done this in the past, and if I do this again in the future, which I probably will at some point, but I need to remember this because this is true. Blaming the refs for a loss is the free space of NFL loser bingo. It absolutely is. But get your bingo card, look at the free space. It says you already get a free marker on the spot there in the middle. And instead of saying free, it says blame the refs. Congratulations. That's what blaming the refs is. It's the free space in NFL loser bingo. Don't do it. Don't go there. Okay? Even even if it's true, like the Saints and the and the was it the Saints and the Rams from 2017, 2018, whatever the year that was? Was that is that right? Yeah, Saints and Rams. The uh the pass interference that wasn't called? Should a pass interference been called in that play? Absolutely, it should have been called. They didn't call it. Did it cost them the game? Well, how do we know that they were going to score anyway? Drew Brees could have thrown a pick six on the next play. They could have been stopped on four downs and never made it to the end zone. You don't know, okay? When you're blaming the refs for something like that, you essentially what you're doing is you're ignoring everything else that got you to that point. Let's go back and so if you're going to blame the referees for calling that that flag on Bradbury, here's all the things you have to ignore. Okay, you have to ignore the Jalen Hurts fumble, the unforced air fumble to return for a touchdown. You also have to ignore the referees blowing the second return fumble return for a touchdown by Nick Bolton. You also have to ignore the non call on the what bit of a first down on the in the first half. Same two players. You also have to ignore the two, I'll put two, four and five, 
Kadarius Tony and Sky Moore being wide open in the ends are you know on the goal lines with no players within 10 to 12 yards of them and walking in for touchdowns in the fourth quarter of a Super Bowl. You also have to ignore the fact that the team with the second most sacks in NFL history didn't record a single sack in the entire game. Going up against two very marginal tackles in Orlando Brown Jr. and Andrew Wiley. Why do we have to ignore all of those aspects of the game? If the Eagles get to Mahomes and sack him like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers did, if they don't allow Travis Kelsey to run free in the middle of the field, if they don't decide just to not guard two players on the goal line, this game probably has a very different result. If Jalen Hurts decides just to not drop the football on third down to have it returned for a touchdown, does anybody talking about the official? No. Why is it always, when it, when it comes down to when games are tight, games are tight because you got to that point for a reason. Look, the Chiefs allowed a tight game as well. There were mistakes that they made. They couldn't get off the field on third down. They consistently allowed guys to get fight for extra yards after first contact. It was driving me bananas all game. If they if they put guys into the ground and stick them, you know, where they hit them, how many more punts would the Eagles have had? The Chiefs may have won this game by the score I thought, 38-21. If they would have actually just tackled guys when they first hit them. So, again, don't blame the refs for the loss. The Chiefs were going to get a field goal there. And plus, there's no guarantee that Jalen Hurts was going to go down and, you know, score a touchdown and win that game. Or, well, it would take a touchdown on a two-point conversion to win the game. There's no guarantee of that. The, they had scored one touchdown in the second half. And it was, you know, and it was the result of a 50-yard pass on broken coverage. Other than that, they were not moving the ball in the second half at all. They couldn't do it. So, again, don't revise history on this. I mean, the, both teams made mistakes throughout the game. The difference was the Chiefs, you know, had the opportunity to capitalize them on the end at the end because they had the ball last. And it, honestly, it came down to the team that had the ball last. Now, Grant, I know the Eagles had the ball last, but they had the ball for one desperation Hail Mary um, that was – a horrible pass by Hurts. That, that was a really poor effort um, on that situation. I mean, he underthrew everybody by 30 yards. I don't even know what he was doing. But so, again, he, he was throwing to the center, to the center, and to the right. So, couldn't throw that. Can't throw very far that way because of his shoulder. Um, one last thing, and I, I got to run here. Um, but one more point I want to make. Jarek McKinnon, I'm going to. Tip my hat to you, buddy. Uh, Jarek McKinnon could have scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl, and he chose not to because it was for the best interest of the team. Uh, the Eagles were going to let him score with about a minute 40 left in the game. Of course, this was after the penalty. And McKinnon slid down at the one and a half yard. He made sure he picked up the first down, and uh, then he slid down, gave himself up without crossing the goal line. Absolutely tremendous tremendous he gave up glory scoring a touchdown he gave it up for the team now if he scores the touchdown and then the eagles drive down in a minute and 30 seconds and then get a touch on themselves and sirianni goes for two and they make it and they win the game 43 42 what's everybody talking about everyone's well, they'd be talking about the Chiefs' defense, but they would also be talking about how selfish Jarek McKinnon was. So, Jarek McKinnon, you gave up personal glory to ensure the Chiefs would have an immensely more, an, a, a exponentially greater chance of winning that football game by not scoring that touchdown. Going against every instinct in your body to just run it on into the end zone. So congratulations to you. You absolutely deserve um, every accolade from the season, all the receiving touchdowns that you got. And I hope every high school coach in this city puts an example, uh, makes you as an example for their own players next season and, and showing what sacrificing for the greater good actually does when it comes to the game of football. So 
Um, I need to wrap this up here. I'm at, I'm right under 50 minutes and I have to leave here in about five minutes to run an errand. So again, just my final thoughts on the legacy of Patrick Mahomes, the legacy of Andy Reid and the Chiefs. This is the second Super Bowl win in four years for the Chiefs. This puts Mahomes on a different level now. I don't ever want to hear the comparisons between him and Josh Allen and Joe Burrow ever again. And they only better come out of the closet, those comparisons, if one of those two quarterbacks manages to match or eclipse him in Super Bowl titles, which I don't see that happening, especially with both of those those organizations coming up against the, well, especially the Bills coming up against the, the cap situation that they're currently in, and the Bengals about to be in the cap situation because Burrow's going to command a massive contract, and T. Higgins is likely to be, is it Higgins? Yeah, Higgins is likely to be traded to, like the Chiefs traded uh, Tyreek Hill. So what is what does this mean for, where does Mahomes sit right now with two MVPs, two Super Bowl MVPs, or when I say two two league MVPs, two Super Bowl uh, game MVPs, two rings, uh, two you know five AFC championship uh, games, where does he sit all time? I would personally put him number four on my all time list. I know that Nick Wright put him number three on his list. I I would still put Peyton Manning ahead of him. I think Peyton Manning's MVP total eclipses what Mahomes obviously has done five to two or four to two whatever it is um and I think Mahomes is squarely at number four it's gonna if he gets he doesn't have to eclipse Manning's MVPs to move past me because if he does that he's gonna move past Montana as well um if if Mahomes wins another MVP next year and the Chiefs win the Super Bowl again then yeah I I would probably put him Matter of fact, I may run him to number two if that happens. If he goes back to back, I may run him past Manning and Montana at that point. Um, but we'll see what happens. The Chiefs obviously are installed already as the betting favorite to win uh, Super Bowl Fifty Eight. Are they going to repeat? I mean, they're they're the odds on favorite. But you know, whenever you're projecting favorites, I mean, one team versus the field, you got to take the field. But. Um, I think the Chiefs have the as best of a shot as anybody because the amount of rookies that they played, they played the third most rookies in the league from a snap count this year. Only the Texans and the Bears played more rookies, and those teams are picking one and two in the draft this year. The Chiefs are picking 32. Uh, so the Chiefs have a lot of young players. they got a lot, especially on defense. And I think what the Chiefs do in the draft this upcoming season is focus on getting another wide receiver. I think they're going to lose Juju Smith-Schuster. They're they're going to lose McCole Hardman. Obviously, I don't think either. I don't both. I don't think either of those players are coming back. The Chiefs are going to need some some more experience. Travis Kelsey is getting older. Okay, you know he's he's not a spring chicken. I think he's got three four more good years in him. But you know the Chiefs are going to need some legitimate wide receiver weapons next season. Um, you know to to coincide with what they already have. And on on defense, you know obviously always look for chances to improve. But they've got a lot of young young players in that defense who performed very well down the stretch this season who are only going to get better again i see the chiefs next year without obviously seeing the schedule i see the chiefs going 15 and 2 i see them winning the next and one more game this year getting the one seed again and you know with without looking at everything i see them getting back to the super bowl and do i see them winning it i'm I'm gonna go ahead and say yeah i think they're gonna repeat again a lot of things can change between now and then i want to see what happens in the offseason see what happens in the draft um, but I see no reason, not, especially as a Chiefs fan, to not predict the Chiefs to win again next year. But we have a long ways to go between now and then. So anyway, thanks so much for watching this video, guys. It was a little longer than, than normal, but thank you for sticking to the end. Um, Chiefs win 38-35. They have won the second Super Bowl in, in four years, third in franchise history. Patrick Mahomes is now elevated. At, he's the face of the NFL now. Face of the NFL And the Chiefs are now the new villains. They're the new Patriots now. They are the villains for the rest of the league. And I'm all here for it. Bring it on, baby. We are here. I'm relishing the opportunity to be the the hunt to be the hunted now. So Chiefs are the top dog, and there's not going to be anyone knocking them off for quite a while. As long as Andy Reid and Mahomes are running the show, it's going to be really tough to knock them off. So, and again, thanks for watching this video. If you like it, please give me a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel for more content, and I will talk to you later. See you guys.